Yes. There's been a lot of questions asked about the man here in Dallas that has Ebola and the apartment that he lives in and whether that apartment where he was sick for so long, if that was still contagious? And yeah. how many days later is it still contagious? That's, that story intrigued me, and I have to mention it now. It intrigued me when I saw it on TV, that for one family, one person's infection, you had the fire, the fire force, you had the big cleaning <laughs> agent, you had, even the cars were all covered. Then I said, I wonder how people feel if they were in Sierra Leone. When even the, we can count the number of doctors we have, we don't have up to 200 doctors in a country like Sierra Leone. We don't have up to 500 midwives or nurses. We don't even have majority of the people, let's say 40% or 60% of Freetown don't have pipe bomb water. Yes. We don't have, we, if our government does not have enough personal protective cares, they don't have enough of these barrier teams to go around. I wonder how, if Americans went to Sierra Leone and they were told the treatment center where they are treating these patients with nothing. It was amazing when I saw that story. For one person, from Puerto resources for a whole country, for Liberia, for let's say the four countries that are being involved. Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, <coughs> Nigeria. That's just something to think about. But yet, I think that, that, that we are told that uh, the quarantine must last for 21 days. The house should be fumigated and closed till after 21 days before it can be feel safe. Our people stay in their homes with nobody knowing whether they can eat, and they say they are quarantined. They don't have enough water, they don't have enough food. In a family with maybe like 10 in one household, it's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing, yes. I don't know. What kind of a mic does the virus have outside of the body? Like yes. Yeah. In the contamination of a home, uh, uh, moisture on the toilets, uh, on the handles of the sinks and things like that, doorknobs, how long would it take for that virus to disintegrate or to die? I think it lives longer in moisture. And the longer it, it stays in moisture, it can last for days. But as long as it's dry, and if you use like the chemicals, the chlorine, it kills the virus. So the lady that it was that in that that's affected, she did say she was using Clorox to clean the surfaces in her house. For us, we we just quarantine people for 21 days and assume that it's all is well after. And we have not had any reports yet that people after the quarantine have had episodes or have been infected. They actually would test everyone who is quarantined for the virus. Yes. Yes, you can be reinfected. If you expose yourself again, surely you'll be reinfected. But you will have more antibodies then because your body because your body develops antibodies, makes the person to be well, to survive the infection. You see, I, I am comparing this with HIV. If we look back at HIV, we had the same methods, modes of transmission, not so? We had the same messages we are giving for HIV. The only difference with HIV is the sweat. Because we are not, nobody had told us that sweat carries a, the HIV virus. But in this case, Ebola, uh, sweat carries Ebola, 
a, 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 a virus. And that means it, it, you can contract it through the pores of your skin if you can go through sweat, because sweat comes through from the pores of your skin. You see, that's the only difference. But it is hemorrhagic, just like, I mean, HIV is transmitted through body fluids. And if you are careless about vomit or, or, or feces or semen and that, you will get it. It's the same thing with Ebola, you see. That is the burial team. They go and pick the bodies up and with no family members, take the bodies away to an unknown grave. So when we did the training, the bishops and the leaders, the religious leaders, they said we have to make a representation to government to allow the, the, the religious leaders to at least accompany the burial team to where their members are laid so that they can say a prayer. They do not have to touch the, the, the because this is bad twice. They first would spray the body, then they bag it once, then spray, then they bag it a second time before it's taken. So it's really like fumigated before the person is taken to the grave. But it's like a common grave. Those who've been on the internet and have seen it, you, are, you may have seen the grave. I was very upset when I saw that grave, the grave, because it's like common grave. You see, that too has its own implications. Because getting so many corpses in one area, and we have our weather system, the rains, the rainy season, and the, the major means of survival is farming. I'm just thinking of tomorrow. What are going to, what is going to be the other implications of this? So we had made that ap um, appeal that the, 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 the leader, the religious leader, to whichever denomination that person belong, be allowed and gowned and prepared to follow so that at least they can identify where the person is laid. That started to be done. I understand in, in, in Liberia, they are, they are cremating each and every one of those bodies. Yes, which is sensible. So you do not have that tomorrow, yes, sir? Are there cultural <laughs> customs that would discourage the cremation? Yes, bodies? yes. Is is this is why Sreven is still buried. But the ideal for Ebola patient corpses is to be burnt. Because I read somewhere, or somebody gave me the information that um, when they had Ebola epidemic in Uganda, in one of the villages they had to burn even the houses. And that was how they were able to, to, to get rid of the virus from that community. But there are cultural uh, um, beliefs sometimes plays a part in, in the way we live and the way we address responses. These are victims. Those are the recent victims of Ebola. The gentleman is a, a medical doctor. Oh, sorry. A medical doctor, I understand, from Uganda, was working with UN. And this is an RN, a registered professional nurse. She passed. She even took this picture, as you can see, in a ward. And she too died to Ebola. To date, I'm sure we've lost over 150 health workers in Sierra Leone to Ebola. We've had lost four doctors in a country where you don't have up to 100 doctors. So that's a big challenge. Now, what are the effects of Ebola on us? Health-wise, I don't have to explain that. It's devastating. People are not healthy. People are not having enough food. People are, they're just barely surviving. There is not enough water supply. There is not enough food. Most people are depending on those who have families places like America. Those of you who have family who are Australians, I'm sure you are getting calls. And people are telling you what they need. When you quarantine a family 
and you just go around and give them a bar of soap, a bar of soap, and tell that person, a family of five, to wash their hands 15 times a day. And they cannot even afford chlorine to put in their water. So we just say, wash your hands anytime. You use the bathroom, develop, increase the, 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 the culture of washing hands. Increase the culture of doing, taking care of your personal hygiene. And even the children are taught that. Unfortunately, there's no, no economics going on. Almost all the companies, the, their staff have left and left us, except those countries that have now sent health workers to help us with the epidemic. So economy is at a standstill. Even the local markets where people would take their vegetables, the community people farm, they bring their vegetables, their bananas, their pepper, which they sell to survive, has been stopped since June. People are not even visiting themselves. Social impact. We, can't, we don't allow guests to come to us anymore in our houses because we are not sure what they have. So those who have gates, their gates are closed. Yes. Somebody will call and say, I want to visit you. We say, no, don't visit me yet. <laughs> then when the government shut down, the whole country made it even worse. And they don't have enough resources to go around to give every family food that had been shut down. You see, people had to go out. They go to the market, they sell before they buy food for that day. That stopped. And even when the people died, they had corpses, they would call the hotline 117, and it would take like two days before they come to clear the corpse from the home. Socially, we're, we're very antisocial of late. <laughs> yes. We are a visiting people. Somebody will just get up. They don't even call you. <laughs> they, you see their bundle. <laughs> they, they, they have arrived. And you are welcome. But no, not anymore. Even in vehicles, taxis, the government says taxis must take only three people at any one time. And the fear cost is so high. How can a business person use, instead, instead of taking five, says three? for one trip, one in front of the car, two on either side of the window, one person on either side of the window. For buses, you can only take six. So all that has grounded the whole economy. So when government says we are shutting down, we have already shut down even before government shut us down. I, get, I even got a call this morning. It's like I'm here, but I'm working. I have to give supervision. I have to give ideas. I have to give input. This is why the church took the honors now to do com go community to community. So anywhere where they have shut down the districts, the church sends teams to those districts to identify the homes that have been quarantined, the communities that have been quarantined, to provide them with basic food, basic soap, you know, give them those buckets and teach them. Where they cannot give enough, they will tell them, okay, if you have a bowl, you can put the bowl here, put a cup and be using that cup to wash your hands. Because we go very basic. <laughs> we, 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 we go very basic in our, in our thoughts. So that education, forget it. Schools have been closed since June. Schools and colleges in all these countries have been closed since June. And this is, we're almost, we're in October. So there's no education, there's no university education, the children are at home, and imagine young people at home are not occupied. Forget about television, we, we don't have that. We don't even have electricity. Those who are fortunate to have generators, fuel is about six or seven dollars a gallon. How much? When I'm home, I use a gallon a day. And it's only for four hours. 
that's electricity. I am. <laughs> I, I, that's what I can provide. So sometimes when people email me and I don't respond like two days, they say, oh, we wonder where Beatrice is. They don't even know I don't have electricity for that day. Sometimes the office, we don't have electricity. So those are some of the issues we're dealing with in Sierra Leone. We look to you. We are looking forward to you, the church. We want the pastors to speak about Ebola. We want every church to speak about Ebola in Sierra Leone and West Africa. That is the only way we hope and we are praying. We continue to pray in all our hospitals. They pray every morning before work starts for this epidemic to be controlled. Because it has, it has actually put, dealt with the very fabric of not only the individual, but our social life, our, every aspect of life Ebola has touched. So, we are looking to this almighty God. We know he made us. So we just believe that one day God will help us to be able to control this menace in our communities. Please help us to stop Ebola. Whatever resources you have, send it to UMCO. United Methodist Committee on Relief of the General Board of Global Ministries. It will be received. If you, can de if you want to designate it to any country, it will be used for that country. If you want me to know, if you go on the website, my, my email is there. If you want any information about me, you ask the general, even UMCO, because I work directly with uh, Ted Warner, they'll be able to give you my information. But I thank all of you. On behalf of the Sierra Leone Conference, United Methodist Church, I thank all of you for all your donations you have been making, for all the input you have made into the health program, especially the Imagine No Malaria. Can you imagine if we didn't have Ebola? Can you imagine if uh, an Ebola-free Sierra Leone education will work? Children will go to school. They will grow up. To hear that there was Ebola and not to see Ebola. Can you imagine Israel if there was no Ebola? How much economic development we'll have? We were just being proud to say, oh, we are getting rid of malaria. And then Ebola shows up. So thank you very much for listening. I will take us. Yes. You had mentioned the animals, basically bats were the ones who carried it and infected other animals, and that the animals did not suffer pain. And did you say animals don't have any antibodies? No, they don't. They don't suffer the disease. Okay. So they cannot develop antibodies. So do they? Do they die from it? Well, yes, and the, the, the unfortunate thing, we mentioned about animals because that's one method of transmission, of eating. If you ate, so one of the messages that avoid eating any animal. <coughs> we even call it bush meat. <laughs> yes. Yes, my sister. You know, if they have the research that's going to, or what they're doing as far as trying to find an antibody, Yes, here, here in the Western world, in the U.S., in England, in Canada even, they have come up with vaccines which they are trying. They are in trial stages. We haven't heard what the outcomes have been. Yes. The vaccine. The vaccine. They are doing human clinical trials. Is it correct that there's more Ebola in Liberia than Sierra Leone? And if so, how do you account for that? Well, uh, one. The Ebola is escalated more in Liberia than Sierra Leone currently because of some mistakes that have been made. I mean, we have reinforced, it's the education 
But I don't think they have reinforced the education of not touching, doing hand washing, and resources. Those are some of the areas, the availability of resources. We, as soon as it was declared Ebola, that there is Ebola in Sierra Leone, the first thing our bishop did was to write to all our partners, please don't visit us until the epidemic is under control. I had teams plan to, to visit me for the health program. And I, I just wrote to the lady, please don't come. I will come. So that's how I got myself in the U.S. I would have been back, been back since September. But then it so escalated. There was no Ebola in Freetown in July. And now Ebola is everywhere. You see? So in Liberia, the stories we heard were devastating. There were still gatherings going on. And the resources are meager. You see? They are, they, they, I don't know whether they reinforce this no touch or no hugging. Because they have their own issues. And as much as we are so similar <laughs> in culture, even in food, each country has their own separate issues. You see? And I think that those are some of the things that is. One, one thing that's helped is our bishop, John Yambas. You see? took it serious and got everybody together. All, yes. the, all the faith community. All the faith based organizations. We've got to get education out. Even the Muslims. We called all of them and said, look, when we had the Civil War, it was the faith-based organizations that came together and said, we cannot continue war. So they said, we, we cannot see Ebola. We cannot allow Ebola to finish our people. So that's how we developed the uh, uh, religious leaders task force on Ebola. And every Muslim, every imam, when they preach their kutubas, the sermon, they would mention about Ebola. They would mention something on, on the prevention. We have made big banners and put it in big towns, in all the districts, so that even the school children will read what the prevention messages are and take it home. So now this, the, uh, somebody told me this morning that they, they, they found like 120 people died. Yes, this is because uh, the education is reaching the majority of the people. Because at first people were in denial and they were keeping their sick people home instead of taking them to the treatment centers, to the hospitals. But now they know that there is treatment, there is some care available. So people are now coming forward and taking their people. And it's unfortunate they are losing people still, but it's better than when they were kept home and they were hidden and they were infecting the whole lot of the others. But now they need more money. To but now centers. we have to have isolation centers in our hospitals. We just have holding centers, like one room where any suspect can be put there till the person is taken to the nearest treatment center. We need like vehicle vehicles to, from those hospitals so that at least when you have a suspect, you don't sit and wait for government. You just take that person straight to the nearest treatment center which will shorten the time, you will keep the person in the hospital. I was here one morning, and they called me, sister, we have a, a gentleman who has worked to Kisi Hospital, and said he's, he's been exposed to Ebola, and feels, he thinks he's been infected. So I said to him, where is he right now? So they said, he's at the gate. I said, keep him at the gate. <laughs> Please don't allow him to come into the hospital. Then we sent one of the nurses, the midwives, they took the infrared thermometer, which you can use without touching the person. They did his temperature. We, they, they, died, they called the 117 hotline, and somebody came and interviewed that man. And you know, they took his blood and we made a referral. That's the kind of thing we have been doing. Because if he had gone into that hospital, <laughs> and if he had proved to be positive, serious, <laughs> This is a hospital that you can have over 100 people coming in there per day to be seen. So those are the issues. We need, we need a lot of support. Now, as I said, there's hunger now. People will call say, hey, Ebola is not killing us, but the hunger is killing us. We need vehicles to be able to transfer. We need basic medications. 
and even the equipment, because those, those equipment you can only use once. So you need more almost all the time. Yes, sir. So like, I'm overwhelmed, and I honestly, I don't know how to help specifically. I mean, definitely, I'm going to bring this up in church. I'm definitely going to talk about this more. But, but what specifics can, can I do to help? Because I feel helpless right now. If you have, you can raise funds. It's better you raise funds and send it to UNCO instead of getting physical uh, uh, materials. Because if you send physical materials to UNCO, the shipment, because they too pay for shipment. But if you send funds, they can collect, they know what uh, we need, and they get it in one shipment and get us. Those, be, those personal protective gears were shipped by air. Yes, they were shipped by air, because if it had gone by sea, it would take three months. So actually donating. And if you want, you can be specific which country. Yeah, they've got a special yeah. fund for yeah. West Africa. It's, uh, yeah. If you were able to pick up this flyer, the fund number is on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is David Williams. I'm originally from Sierra Leone also. I live here in the Metro Plus. I've been here since 1980. Well, I really feel just from listening to her, this is going to be a multi approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. Multi in the sense, not everybody who is dying having vomiting and diarrhea yes. is dying from people. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's possible. People are dying because they are not getting treatment for malaria. Yes. And typhoid. Yes. So maybe we really need to have a testing. That's what probably is going to be the most efficient way to separate the three diseases. The testing aspect. Once we are able to separate those who don't have people, then we we'll also need to be able to provide them the help they need for typhoid and malaria at least. Because those people are going to be susceptible easily to new diseases. So the multi task approach, just by listening to her, it's nothing that I, I've read or I, I have any insight. I live here. But the fact that someone is complaining of having Ebola type symptoms, which are not Ebola, Ebola. they probably are going to be ignored. And yes. then they die. Yes. We are, to reinforce what he's saying, we have had incidents where people have been ignored. And they would go to hospital for even uh, the person had appendicitis. And there were no doctors, and that person died. You see, so we are having deaths for other disease conditions. So what's one of the things, I'm glad you mentioned this, that we have been asking for is like testing kits. Testing kits for Ebola, testing kits for even malaria, so that you can easily Test this person. You know, we have now they have instant tests for HIV. We have those that we test people within 20 minutes, half an hour. We can know your status. So if that comes up, if we can get those kind of test kits in our hospitals or everywhere, so that people can walk in and test. Because I think this Ebola, we are going to end up testing everybody to know their status for us to be able to control it. Because people don't know. In fact, it's, Ebola is even better. But HIV, you can go within three, four, five, six months. There are people who have never tested themselves, but they are HIV positive. They are alive. But with Ebola, it doesn't take you up to 21 days. So the sooner you can get yourself tested, then you have the rest of mind. Then you start, and you start doing things to prevent yourself reinfecting yourself or infecting any other person. I think we're going to come to that, to be able to really actually control. So that if we have like test kits or means of testing in each of our hospitals and our health centers, and have people trained, so as soon as you walk in, somebody will come to you dressed up properly, will give you the education, don't be afraid of me, because I'm wearing this, I just want to help you, let me just do your blood, 
then within 20 minutes or 30 minutes, they come back and say, oh, you're okay. But they give you that post-test ed education like we did for HIV. I think that would be a big plus. Um, we did such an effective job as the United Methodist Church, as you have said, to help with the Imagine No Malaria campaign. And we were on the forefront of that in the North Texas Conference. Yes. And how we disseminated that information to our individual churches to help get this information out was so helpful. And I see if we took and built upon what we have done with that, and had like a, a, a poster yes. that gave bullet points of what the problems are and then gave an effective way for a person in the congregation. And just like a net costs $10, that saves lives. Mm -hmm. Someone in the congregation gets that. Yes. If you had on the poster something like, we need prevention. So what we need for, for prevention, here is a bucket. Rather than filling it up with supplies, yes. imagine here's what it costs. Okay. to have uh, provide a bucket with chlorine yes. for this village. That costs X amount of dollars. Say we need to isolate the sick and say if we bought a testing kit, this is what it would cost for a testing kit. That's what I can do. If you said I want to, these people are now starving. That's a bullet point. Cool. How can I help people not starve? What does cornmeal and uh, protein Rice. powder cost? to help a family that's isolated in their home survive. Now I've given my congregation tools and dollar points mm -hmm. to see how mm -hmm. they can give mm -hmm. and say we're going to give this through UMCOR. Yes, uh, we can work with UMCOR. UMCOR gave us a list just for, for materials. Let me just emphasize, yes. the UMC church as a whole, global, you just don't know how much power we have over this government. I really feel if North Texas, for example, will get the information to New York that we must pressure the government of Sierra Leone, we have to insist on that. Trust me, the UNC government is very powerful in Sierra Leone. We have to take that forcefulness to action and say, why don't we have a month designated as a testing month? The whole month of this month. You've got to do it, Sierra Leone. The government, you have to do it. We have the manpower, or we have to train the manpower, and let's test everybody in December, for example. And we will start to eliminate and decrease the people who are not affected, and hopefully there will be a follow-up. But the UMC Church, again, I insist, got to be involved in politics one way or another. It's a political issue, but the government is not going to budge. But trust me, when it comes from the United States, they listen. <coughs> they listen. Our leaders here have to take that mandate to the government of Sierra Leone, that we believe this would be one approach, or whatever we come up with, a strategy, we've got to approach the government directly. Just don't leave it to bishops and the masses. Yes, sir. What you say, the money then for the testing kits is a primary? Yes, testing kits. How much is a testing kit? I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't have that information. But maybe you can get it from like Unco. What does it consist of? Uh, the, the test kits we have, those preventive kits we have. Uh, the test kits are, uh, I mean, it's blood tests, they have chemicals and things like that. I really don't know. I'm a nurse, I know uh, there the are chemicals they use in the laboratories. To test the blood? Yes, to test the blood. But now I understand there are instant test kit, kits like. They're like uh, what you, you use to test urine, you know, those kinds of things. There are, which you can put blood on, like what you do for HIV. You take a, a drop of blood and put it on a small uh, chemical strip and something like that. I haven't seen it myself. Since I've been here, I got that information. And the Chinese have opened a huge uh, treatment center. And I understand they are testing 
people for less than I, and they're getting results. So um, I cannot even say that it's true or it's not. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a nurse, I believe in seeing and observing myself to be able to confirm, but it is happening. Yes, so I'm sure if you went on the website, uh, when I came, I was in Indiana having meetings with for Kissy Hospital. And one of the ladies was on the internet, and she said, oh, I think they can have even test kits, uh, instant test kits for Ebola. So I said to her, I said, where is it? You know, but we got distracted. So those of you are, who are technology, <coughs> who, are, who know technology and can solve, I'm sure you'll be able to provide those information for us. For the costing, honestly, I cannot say. If the basic items like food, like rice, we know a 50 kilo bag rice is a $50 equivalent now. It used to be 20. It used to be 20, but now it's 50, because it's 200,000. Yes. We know all the basic condiments, everything has gone up because of the scarcity, you see. So and for now, we cannot, uh, uh, well, I cannot give you costs, but there are conferences who would normally would send containers of uh, milk, some rice, nutrition of rice. Uh, North Carolina did that recently. They worked with Stop, Stop Hunger Project, Indiana. Indiana, and they have sent a container from their own, you see. But sometimes it's a challenge to even clear those containers once they get to sell them. This is why we are saying it's much easier for you here if you get the money, send it through UNCO so that people, you know, they can get some of those materials. They can release it to us. When they release it to us, then we can provide them locally. Because it's a challenge really to send containers. Um, another container I have is the barrier. Or that the yes, because I've been thinking about the future, like you said. Yes. You know, we don't want another problem. So I don't know how we can approach this. You know, if, if, if people can come together, yes. talk with the president, yes. do something about it. They'll be burning the, yes. the bodies, you know. Yes. But that's a real concern. Yeah, this is this is a this is one issue that is being thought about as I speak. The religious leaders are looking at that. Some of the Muslims would follow their member to where they are buried. Some people have had opportunity to dictate to the barrier team that our person will want this person to be laid here instead of being taken. This is why it's important that the person or the family know and the family be allowed to participate and to have a say into what happens to the, to the remains of their loved ones. But that discussion is on. Because I strongly really would think it would be better for us to cremate than to continue burial. Can you imagine what we have? We have buried nearly a thousand people. You know? And we look at the geographical area of so It's so small. Yes, ma'am. Yes, mine is not a question, it's a conclusion based on what I have added and what the questions that I, uh, I have just uh, been asked. And uh, thank you very much, first of all, for that wonderful information. I, have, I must confess that I've gained a lot from you. Thank you. Um, so, what I, I think there needs to be some bill of specifications because you, say, you, you, like, you said that. As some help is needed, which genuinely help. But uh, I, I, I think um, our friend here tried to specify that uh, one of the ways that help can be received is by finding uh, the, the, the instant testing kit. But again, uh, if I heard you clearly, the instant testing kit is not yet confirmed if it is there or not. I, I, I'm not saying I'm confirming, uh, but I, what I'm saying is what it felt is like it sounded to be an appealing way of, one of the appealing way of attracting help. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what, and since it's not very clear if it is there or not, what I'd like to suggest is 
can we please uh, check if we can uh, check with confirming those people who were put trying to claim that it is in existence and try to find out if it is there, how helpful is it? Is it? Is it exactly. That's so why I said it, I was so, in shock. <laughs> so if, if it is there, yes. those who want to channel their funds to us, that yes. can do so. Yes. Because right. maybe maybe there are people who feel that before I can donate, I need to know what I'm donating. What what am I donating? Sure. What will my funds? What, which which uh, channel will my funds be taken? To? Yes. Is it the testing kit? Is it the food? Is it the medicine? Is it the medical health care mm -hmm. workers? Yes. Yeah, that will help. I think. Yes, it's very, you're very right. Thank you very much for that input. You know, I I could not specifically say. That's, that was why I said some items, some of those things can be got in country. Because if you look at now, I mean, this is a serious uh, situation. And the quicker we get things to us, the better, the better and the better the results will be. I have heard that there are instant tests. And I have heard that the Chinese are using but we have to confirm. There is somebody in my office who is deputizing me. I have spoke to her this morning. And they give me on a daily basis the things that they need. You know. And they were saying, Sister, if we can get test kits, we can do and they train us. We are nurses who can be able to test other than depending on laboratories. Because the blood tests take at least two days. But if there is an instant test like HIV, you can just do a fingerprint within 20 minutes the person knows then you move the person on you are quite right this is this are, this is what even umko is telling us that as we get the needs we make a list of what we cannot get in country and they can get from out here and send to us but it can be done in a bulk i mean those ppes were sent to us by air you see, not by boat. Mm -hmm. Because if they have sent them by boat, they will still be on, on the high seas by now. Mm -hmm. But now, every unit has those PPEs, and the nurses are using it. You see, so you are quite right, my sister. Thank you for that contribution. I saw your hand. My name is Florence Campbell. Mm -hmm. I'm president of Sisters of Sierra Leone. And these are members of Sisters of Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. We've been around for 17 years since the war. Thank you. But I have a question. Um, the mission is aiding displaced women and children victimized by the war. Mm -hmm. But yesterday somebody was telling us at an interfaith service that all the kids, the orphans who've lost parents to this disease are just mm -hmm. out all over. Exactly. There's nobody to take care of them. Mm -hmm. How can we reach these kids? What can we do? I know this is different from what you're discussing. No, it's not different. It's all part of that discussion. I'm glad you brought it up. Because we deal with mothers, pregnant women. We deal with uh, lactating mothers. We deal with under fives. And, with, and I, I told you about the incident of the grandmother who took the two children to Nigeria. To do that, you can come through, you can go through the United Methodist Conference. We have a women's coordinator. We even have a regional missionary who, who works with the women. This is Emira Selu. Then we have Beatrice Fofana, who is the women's coordinator. And of course my office, I'm dealing with health generally. Which either one of us, we can be able to uh, identify. Because one of the things that we need to do is to identify the locations of these children that have been uh, orphaned by Ebola. We have a program called Vulnerable Children's Program in Kisi Hospital where we have been supporting uh, children who's, who lost their parents to HIV. You see, this can be part of that program so that they can identify people who have uh, lost parents to Ebola. Yeah. United Methodist is got a big following. I'm sure you know that. We are in four districts in Sierra Leone. We are in the north, eastern province. We are in south. We are in the east. And of course, the western area. So we, we, we have 
and most of our smaller units are in the rural setting. You see, we only have two hospitals in Feta. Like Rotifunk Hospital is the only hospital in, in a in a in a chiefdom of like fifteen uh, smaller community uh, um, sections. You see, Rotifunk. And those of you from Sweden have heard about Rotifunk. Rotifunk has been resurrected. It's been rehabilitated. We have a medical doctor uh, stationed at Rotifunk, and work is going on in Rotifunk as I speak. <coughs> and they too have even developed a holding center. So what, those hospitals are centers where people can register to say, oh, I lost so much to this person. And it, it can be easily verified because the workers there are people who live in the communities. So they'll be able to verify those who have actually lost parents to Ebola. <coughs> so we have that kind of facility that we can do that. So you could either go through the women, the women's desk, or you go through the health desk, or you go through the, the bishop. He's very open, he's very health <laughs> minded. I don't see, I'm never allowed to be careless with Bishop Yamasu. <laughs> <laughs> How soon can they test the people here who have been exposed? Or do we just wait to see if they get sick? The people here in the U.S.? Yeah. Oh, they were tested. I mean, the young man, the young man came, he went to hospital, he went home after two days, he went back. Then he got tested. You people test just like that. They've already tested all those people. Yes. They've tested all those who, those... Uh, people who are, who are, uh, uh, um, what do they call them? Who are contact, contact persons. And they've got uh, uh, facilities for, uh, for supplements just like that. We've got nurses going twice a day to take temperature. You see? Can you imagine that? <laughs> we know they have the staff to work in the hospital. They tell me to give you staff to test people <laughs> twice a day. You see, those are some of the disparities we have. Now we just want, we just pray that if we can get like a third of those facilities out there, maybe we would have got rid of this thing long time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you're mentioning the fact that it has to get political. Yes. You know, very, very <coughs> apropos to right here in Dallas. Mm -hmm. I mean, the boobies, the yes. stuff that has gone on has been, as a lay person, as a non-medical person, I am just shocked that they left that family in that house for two weeks without doing anything. I was, I was concerned because I come from Ebola case. And to think that in America, somebody had been tested positive, and the whole three, four days, that home was not visited. It was not quarantined. We just once they take that patient, the person, out of the home and test, but automatically that person, that home is quarantined. People don't, they don't like it, but they are told you cannot go out. If you go out, it's going to be a risk. But to say that we kept that woman on her own in that home for three, four days, we don't know whether they, she got visitors because the people must have brought food for her. She has friends. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, ma'am. Her name is Mary, and if I hear it clearly now, what are the two tips? If you can narrow down everything that you have told us today. Yes. What are the two things that in the Arab the North Texas Conference to participate in helping you? Secondly, mm -hmm. uh, if you go by the issue of testing, if you make it a million now, we do love, you know, testing kids, you cannot test kids, but you need people that are really skilled. Oh, well, children. Children. We you test in kids, well. testing kids must be followed by uh, support to train. Yes, so because you have to Because train. even if you take it there and you don't train people mm -hmm. so to can, use it, it's not. So can you request the own call of this, because you are the medical person who can talk to them, mm -hmm. And they can do it within a day or two to put down the procedures that they, which can be thrown out to us. Yeah. Yes, I will mean. That about the kids, yes. and to, so that we can have all the hospitals, all in the villages where they can do their centers, 
not one, not two, not three, more than that, where we can have testing centers. So the faster this can be done in the whole country, we can do, as we, su we suggested, to be able to eliminate, unless you do the testing, you cannot know who you are treated. Yes. So if you, if you yes, can do that, I think it can do it. Yes, you, yes. We, we said testing, then we said uh, we needed like vehicles, like ambulances or so. Ambulances from those hospitals. So that wherever uh, it's a holding center, that ambulance is there immediately to take the suspect. So those are major, then survivor kids, I would say. Food. Because no matter how, when the person is saved, the person has to live. So those are the food. That's a means of knowing who is who is infected. That's a means of moving that person to the nearest treatment center. Because we cannot own up to say we can uh, do a treatment center. The treatment center entails a whole lot of other things. Because when the staff, you have to keep staff specifically for that. And we don't have that many staff. And we don't have the resources to do a treatment. But government has provided treatment centers, you know, but we need to move mobility to move people from whichever point to, to the nearest treatment center. And as we said, testing kids. So those are, those are three areas. We've already gone over by 30 minutes for our final hour. And I know that you're very passionate about this topic and some of you would like to stay longer and ask more questions and you are free to do that. But those of you that need to leave, I don't want you to feel like you have to stay here because mm -hmm. it's going. So thank you very much for coming and please stay if you'd like to ask more questions. Thank you very much.